I've been asked to give an introductory talk. I'm not an expert on, on early, early mathematics, uh, but the idea is that I'm going to sort of set the scene um, by talking a bit about Egypt and Mesopotamia and about China and, and India. And then it's up to the other speakers to develop what I say or correct it as necessary. So I'm going to start... Uh, and so the, the cultures we're going to be looking at are some of the ones on the timeline here. So I'm going to start the story with Egypt and Mesopotamia, uh, which is shown on, on, on this map here. Uh, ancient Egypt developed along the valley of the Nile, while Mesopotamia, as its name suggests, um, middle of the rivers, it developed between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. But as we'll see, the surviving primary sources of the two cultures are very, very different. Uh, we know relatively little about the Egyptian world because their writings uh, were on papyrus, which rarely survives the ravages of the centuries, and only a handful of mathematical papyruses still exist. On the other hand, Mesopotamian mathematics was printed on clay, imprinted on clay tablets that were baked in the sun, and many, many thousands of these have survived. And incidentally, what I call Mesopotamian mathematics is often called Babylonian mathematics, but that term is, is increasingly going out of use because no mathematical tablets from Babylon have actually come down to us. So let's move to Egypt first. And when we're studying the mathematics of ancient Egypt, we're immediately struck with how little the subject changed over a period of some 3,000 years. Egyptian society was centred around the River Nile, uh, which irrigated the, the, the land so that crops could grow and cities could develop. The civilization was a hierarchical one, headed by the mighty kings and pharaohs. And from about 2700 BC onwards, uh, the pharaohs desired to be buried in massive pyramids. And the oldest of these, King uh, Joseph's step pyramid at Saqqara, was constructed in horizontal layers and supposedly de designed by Imhotep, the celebrated Grand Vizier and architect. But much better known are the magnificent pyramids of Giza, which date from about 2600 BC and attest to the Egyptians' extremely accurate measuring skills. In particular, the Great Pyramid of Cheops has a square base whose sides of length 230 metres agree to less than 0.01%. Uh, constructed from over 2 million blocks uh, and averaging about 2 tonnes in weight and transported 50 miles by a whole army of workers, the pyramid is an impressive 146 metres high. And even more remarkable, it's not solid, it's, it's, it's got an intricate arrangement of carefully planned internal chambers and passageways. Well, as I said, our knowledge of later Egyptian mathematics is scanty, deriving mainly from uh, a small number of fragile primary sources, notably the, the Moscow papyrus, which is about 1850 BC, and the Rhind papyrus, which you can see a bit here, from about 1650 BC. And this is in the British Museum, though I believe they're still hiding it away, and I think we ought to uh, put pressure on them to exhibit it again. So, as I said, here's part of the Rhine papyrus. It shows some geometrical problems, with one of them that I've blown up uh, here uh, so that you can see some of the details. And as you'll see, although some of the problems superficially seem practical in nature, their main purpose seems to have been educational, in fact, uh, um, for the tra training of scribes. And here you can see an Egyptian scribe enjoying his mathematics. So how did the Egyptians count? Well, like most counting systems, theirs was based on 10, but it used different symbols uh, for 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on. It had a vertical rod for 1, um, a heel bone for 10, a coiled rope for 100, a lotus flower for 1,000, and so on. And you recall, of course, that Roman numerals similarly used different symbols for 1, 10, a hundred and a thousand. And then a number is, re is represented by, um, with the appropriate number of each symbol uh, written from right to left. So here are 367, 367, 
and 756, 756. And then you add them together by collecting the symbols together. And whenever you've got a group of 10, you just replace them by the next symbol. So 10 rods gives a heel bone, and 10 coiled ropes gives a lotus flower. Multiplication is more interesting and was done mainly by using successive doubling and halving. Uh, the multiplication by 10 was also simple because you just replace each symbol by the next one. So here is a calculation of 80 times 14 um, taken from the Rhine Papyrus, problem 67. So you write 80, which is 8 of these, and then you replace each heel bone by a coiled rope to give you 800. You then return to your 80 and double it to get 160. As I said, they, they knew how to double. And then you double it again to give 320. And now if you add, you now you're multiplying 80 by 14. So if you add the rows corresponding to 10 and, uh, and 4, then you get the answer. It's this plus this, which is just this, which is 1120. Here's a more complicated problem, which we might think of as algebra. Um, it's number 25 on the Rhine Papyrus. A quantity and its half added together becomes 16. What is the quantity? So in modern algebraic terminology, which of course they didn't use, we'd be trying to solve the equation x plus a half x equals 16. And the method that they used, um, or they frequently used, was called the method of false position. Basically, you guess an answer. You, you guess a convenient answer, it's bound to be wrong, but then you sort of scale it up or down as necessary. So because you've got a quantity in its half, it's convenient to start with two. So a quantity in its half is three. But you don't want three, you want 16. So you've got to scale the three up to 16, and then the same scaling applied to two will then give you the answer. Uh, as they say, as many times as three must be multiplied to give 16, so many times two must be multiplied to give the required number. So doubling is, is used, you start off with the 1 and the 3 and you, you keep on doubling and uh, then to get the 16 here, uh, the corresponding things here are, are 5 and a third. Uh, so doubling is used as is multiplication by 2 thirds. They use fractions of the form 1 over something but they also use 2 thirds. And the appropriate rows are then singled out and added and you get the answer 10 and 2 thirds. And finally under the heading do it thus, they say the answer is 10 and 2 thirds, and they, um, they check the answer. Okay? So this mention of 2 thirds and 1 third and so on uh, leads us to Egyptian fractions, which are very different from the ones that, that we use. So apart from 2 thirds, all their fractions were what we call unit fractions or reciprocals, one over something. So for example, where we would write uh, 2 over 11, uh, they wrote uh, 1 over 6 and 1 over 66. No one's really quite sure exactly what method they used to get these uh, unit fractions. There has been a lot of discussion about these. But if you add these two together, you get uh, what we would call 2 over 11. Um, and here, here's another example. 2 over 13 uh, is 1 over 8, 1 over 52, 1 over 104, as you can quickly calculate in your head. And their ability to calculate with these unit fractions can be seen from problem 31 of the unit papyrus, uh, of the Rhine papyrus. A quantity, it's two-thirds, it's a half, and it's seventh added together give you 33. What is the quantity? So if we were doing it using modern algebraic notation, we'd say x plus two-thirds, x plus a half, x plus seventh x is 33, and we would solve it uh, to give 14 and 28 ninety-sevenths. But if you look in the Rhine papyrus, this is their answer. And it shows an absolutely remarkable ability to calculate with these unit fractions. Okay, have you checked that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do, they, they, how do they do this? They actually use extensive tables of numbers, breaking the fraction down to a succession of, 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 of fractions of the form. Uh, so, so, yeah, the, to do a calculation, they, they, they had tables of numbers, they broke the fraction down to a, a succession of numbers of the form 2 over n, and then and they had this table giving 2 over n uh, for n is equal to 5, 7, 9, all the way up to 101. And you can see that here. 
A rather different type of problem they looked at uh, involves the area of a circle. Um, problem 48 asks the scribe to compare the areas of a circle and its circumscribing square. Uh, so that's the portion of the papyrus, and uh, here is, the, uh, here is the, the problem. And to compare the square and the circle, first of all, you start with, with, with the square, and they chose a particular length of side. They chose nine, and then, so you want nine times nine, so you keep on doubling, and you've got here's a nine and here's a 72, and then you add the one and the eight, and that'll give you 81 as the area of the square. And for the circle, they did a similar thing, but instead of starting with nine, they started with eight, uh, and uh, they ended up with eight times eight is 64. So why did they look at eight? Well, basically, the method they use, as far as we can, we can judge, um, is that they took the diameter. They found uh, in practice that if you take the diameter and remove a ninth of it, so you've got sort of eight ninths of it, and you square that, that gives you a good approximation um, to the area. It has been suggested that it's something to do with an octagon, but I think that's been discounted now. So basically, if you take eight ninths squared and then put it in terms of the radius, uh, it gives you an, an area uh, of this, which corresponds to the value of pi of about 3.16, which is really quite, quite remarkable for the time. So that's all I'd like to say about Egyptian mathematics, and I'd now, now like to go on to Mesopotamian. And although it dates from, or the, the tablets I shall talk about date from the same time as the Rhine Papyrus, the tablets will look at a very different in content. So using a wedge-shaped shape stylus, uh, they imprinted symbols in moist clay, and this is called cuneiform writing, and the tablet was then left to dry in the sun, uh, which is why we've got so many. We've actually, I think we've got hundreds of thousands of, of, of clay tablets that have survived, uh, uh, and, and, and many thousands of these are mathematical. And there's been a lot of exciting work done on them recently by people like Eleanor Robson and others. Well, unlike the Egyptian counting system, which is a, a decimal system with different symbols representing the powers of 10, the Mesopotamian system was a place value sexagesimal system. That is, it's a system based on the number 60. And it used only two symbols. It used this for 1 and this for 10. And then a symbol like this, uh, there are 41 uh, so, yes, there are 40, 41 sixties uh, added together with a 40. Okay, 41 and 40 sixties. But the problem is um, you have to look at these things from the context uh, because uh, this, can be inter this can be broken up in different ways and there aren't, it might be a 60th of this or it might be 60 times this or whatever. Uh, so the same succession of symbols might refer to, say, for example, 60 plus 2, or 60 squared plus 2 times 60, or 1 plus 2 sixtieths, depending on the context. But this idea of context is something which may seem strange to us, but in fact it's something we use all the time. Uh, 650, that might represent to us time, 10 to 7. Or it might be the cost of a, a bus trip to Cambridge, £6.50 or the cost of a flight to Singapore, £650. If we say £650 uh, from the context, uh, we usually know what we're talking about. Well, there are essentially two types of, of, of mathematical tablet. There are the table texts uh, listing tables of numbers that are used in calculations, and problem texts in which problems are posed and solved. And recently, Alan Robson has suggested a third type, uh, because, of course, these clay tablets were used for educational teaching purposes, and there are quite a lot of tablets which could be described as rough work. <coughs> We've got a student who's sort of doing, doing little uh, problems on their clay tablet, just as we would on a scrap bit of paper. There are several table texts, uh, and some of these present multiplication tables. So here's the nine times table. This is a drawing of it, and here's actually a picture of the, of the, of, of the five times table. So you can actually see down here the numbers 1, 2, 3, up to, um, up to 14, and multiply them by 9, and you get the answers on, on the right. So they have these, these, these tablets um, that they can refer to when they're doing their calculations. 
And there were lots of other tables. There were tables of reciprocals and so on. Quite a lot of things that they could use, um, just the way that we um, may use tables. As far as problem text is concerned, here's an example of a problem from a problem text. Uh, it's this one. I found a stone but did not weigh it. After I weighed out six times its weight, added two gin, that's, uh, don't misinterpret that, uh, and added one third of one seventh multiplied by twenty fourth, I weighed it one mana. What was the original weight of the stone? Uh, the problem is clearly not a practical one, because <laughs> if you want the weight of a stone, why not just weigh it? But in fact, it's one of 22 problems of a very similar type, all on the same tablet, and all ending up with one mana. So this leads us to believe that the tablet was a teaching tablet. Now, one can find from the context, uh, analysing these things, that you find that one mana is 60 gin, and so let's do the calculation. So if x, again, this is modern notation which they wouldn't have used, um, so if, if x uh, is, is the weight of the stone, you weigh, take 6 times its weight and add 2 gin, so that's 6x plus 2. Then you add 1 third of 1 seventh multiplied by 24. So here's 1 third of 1 seventh multiplied by 24. Of what? Not the weight of the stone, but of the stage you've reached in the calculation so far. And it's from, by looking at these things and working out what's going on, we actually realise that what, what you put here is a 6x plus 2, and that's equal to 60, so x is 4 and a third gin. And then they, they give a, quote, a, a check, which you can do, uh, and you find that you get the right answer. Our next problem is rather more complicated. I have subtracted the side of my square from the area, 1430. That means 1460s plus 30. And here's the solution. You break off half of 1, that's 0, 030. 0, 030 you multiply, you add 0, 015 to 1430, result 1430, 15. This is the square of 2930. You add 0, 030, which is what you multiplied by. Uh, so 2930, you've got the answer 30, the side of the square. So what's going on here? Well, in modern notation, uh, you're subtracting the side of a square from an area. Well, of course, that's something you can't do geometrically. But if you think of, uh, of, of the side as x in modern terminology, uh, and, and the area is x squared, so you've got x squared minus x is this number here, which is 870. So in modern terminology and modern ways of thinking about it, it's solving what we now call a quadratic equation. And the method is, so, so you, you write down 1, which is the coefficient here, and, and you halve it, and you square, and, uh, which is that, and then you add it to the 870, okay, and then you take the square root, and then you add that half, which gives you 30, and the answer is 30, 30 squared minus 30 is 870. So they had a method for taking a particular, what we would now call a quadratic equation, and finding uh, uh, um, a solution of it. And in fact, if you apply the similar thing to x squared minus bx equals c, the same sort of method, they didn't give a general method, but they gave several examples. Uh, uh, they were solving particular equations, and, uh, and if you do it, you actually get this, which is very much like... It's, a, it's essentially the quadratic equation formula that we have now. But of course that's looking at it from modern terms rather than um, from the times of, of the time. Um, there's a particularly unusual tablet I want to show you before I move on. Uh, and this shows a square with its two diagonals. And then there are various numbers uh, imprinted in, in the clay. Um, the numbers 30, 1, 24, 51, 10 and 42, 25, 35. And what it turns out is that these refer to the side of, of, a, of, 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 of the square, that's 30, the square root of 2, and the length of the diagonal, which is 30 times the square root of 2. So here's 30, uh, and here's, here's the square root of 2, and here's the length of the diagonal. And the amazing accuracy of the square root. The square root of 2, they give us 1, 24, 51, 10. 
And if you want to see how accurate it is, you, if you square it, you get 1, 59, 59, 59, 38, 1, 40, which, is, which differs by, from 2 by a really tiny amount. So it's amazing how accurate they, they had got the square root of 2 at the time. Well, there are other um, well-known tablets. There's one called Plimpton 322, uh, which is very controversial, but that would take me quite a lot of time to, uh, to, to talk about, so I'm going to leave that one. Um, I did talk about it some years ago in one of the Gresham lectures, so it's all on the web if you want to look. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of controversy about it, what, it, what it really means. Some people say it's right-angle triangles and... Um, X, uh, solutions a squared plus b squared e equals c squared. That's largely been discounted uh, um, by Eleanor Robson and others, and uh, she has written some very attractive articles about what she feels it's really all about. But rather than getting involved, uh, the, the, the text is called uh, Plimpton 322, and her name is Eleanor Robson. I'm sure if you Google her, uh, she wrote a very attractive and easy to read article in the American Mathematical Monthly. I think in 2002, perhaps, uh, January 2002, and it's well worth, well worth looking at. But it's very controversial, so I won't get involved with that. And I'm now going to turn uh, to the mathematics of China and India. Around 250 BC in India, King Ashoka's edict, edicts were written on vertical pillars around the kingdom, and numerical information appeared on these pillars. It was written in a place system based on 10 and seems to have been the origin of what we now call the Hindu Arabic numerals. The numerals we use now with its separate columns for units, tens, hundreds, and so on. So instead of having um, different symbols for 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on, you've just got the symbols um, 1 to 9 and later 0 to 9 and then all the other numbers you write in, in terms of those and it's, of course, it's the position of, of, the, of the number that counts. So uh, the, three, the two threes in 33 play different roles. Okay, one, one is three units and the other is three tens. Well, the Chinese had a couple of different counting systems, but uh, they had counting boards um, in which there were separate compartments for units, tens, hundreds, and so on. So here you can see 6,736, and here's 2,101 as we would now write them. So there are, only, there are only nine different symbols, from one to nine, although each of them had two forms. Uh, here's the, the vertical form, and then the other form, you turn them on their size, and, and you get these different forms here. And I think the, uh, it seems to be the reason for that is so that you can actually distinguish them more easily if they're in consecutive boxes. Okay, so, for example, the 6 here is the upside-down version of the 6 here, but here the two ones are the same. And if you have a 0, uh, then you just leave the, the box empty, the compartment empty. I mean, in this, this context, it might have been natural to introduce a 0 symbol for the empty box, but they didn't actually do so. But the Indians did, however. Uh, whether they were familiar with Chinese counting boards is unknown although the Chinese certainly visited India, and the boards were trans transportable, a bit like laptops, well, not quite like laptops. So, so it, it's quite possible. But in any case, the Indian number system, um, the, it, it did develop as a place value system based on 10, using only the numbers 1 to 9, uh, unlike the Egyptian and Greek symbols, but eventually, and possibly around 400 AD, uh, bringing in the number of 0. So I'd like to look at the mathematical activities of China and India in, in more detail, although primary source material is very sketchy, and in particular uh, the, the Chinese wrote on, on bamboo and, and on paper, and not very many of these things have, have survived. First of all, there's an ancient Chinese legend about the Emperor, the emperor Yu standing on the banks of, of the River Lo. Now, this was a, a tributary of the Yellow River, when apparently a tortoise or turtle emerged from the river uh, with, a, with a, a, a magic square on its back. Uh, uh, this may not be a very common um, <laughs> thing. Uh, it, it certainly was a pattern of numbers, uh, and, and it, it looked a bit like this. Okay. 
It's a three by three magic square in which the sum of the numbers in each row and each column and the two main diagonals were all the same. Six plus nine plus two is 15. Um, four plus five plus six is 15 and so on. Over the centuries, this particular pattern of numbers came to acquire great religious and mystic significance and appeared in many different forms, as you can see. And although Emperor Yu lived about 200 BC, there was no evidence of the story until much later, and possibly as late as the Han Dynasty, which started in 206 BC. There's a very, very nice book by Frank Sweats, all about the origins of the Lo Shu, uh, and it's not really known when the story dated from. Um, Current guesses seem to be about 1,000, 1,200 BC, but no one is really quite sure. Now we're coming back to 206 BC. It was around that time that uh, some classic Chinese texts ap appear, and one of these was um, had the snappy title of the Arithmetical Classic of the Gnomon and Circular Paths of Heaven, which contained a, a ce celebrated dissection proof of Pythagoras' theorem. I'm sure you've seen various di uh, dissection proofs of Pythagoras' theorem. Here, here is one. And using a picture like this, one can, can um, obtain uh, the, the, the famous Pythagorean theorem. One should probably say Pythagorean theorem because there's no evidence that Pythagoras really had anything to do with the theorem. Another classic Chinese problem of the time, or problem type of the time, uh, which can be solved using the Pythagorean theorem, are problems of broken bamboos. So here's uh, a, a, an example uh, of, um, of this. So there's a bamboo 10 feet high, uh, and the upper end, well, it's not feet, I think they used chi was the, was, was, was the unit, but we'll call them feet anyway. You've got 10 feet high, and the upper end of it is broken, and it reaches the ground at a distance three from the, from the stem. Find the height of the, of the, of the break. And so in modern algebraic notation, and we we're solving it now, and of course the Chinese didn't have this, uh, if you call this answer x, and this is y, which is the same as 10 minus x, and then you use the Pythagorean theorem, then you can calculate, uh, cal calculate uh, the answer. Okay. So you've got these equations here. And it's quite a complicated, uh, quite a, quite a complicated answer. So they seem to be able to, do, to solve problems of this kind. And this particular bamboo problem appeared in another great early text, the Nine Chapters on the Mathematical Art. This is probably the most important of the Chinese texts. It's a remarkable work which contains 246 questions with answers, but with no working shown. And it may have been used as a textbook, with the methods, of course, given orally. It deals with both practical and theoretical matters. For example, their problems from agriculture, business, surveying and engineering, the discussions of the areas and volumes of various geometrical shapes, the calculation of square roots, even the calculation of cube roots, the study of right angle triangles, and the solution of simultaneous equations. And the last area in particular is very remarkable. Uh, here is an example. There are three types of grain, which we'll call good, moderate, and poor. Three bundles of good grain, two bundles of moderate grain, and one bundle of poor grain take up 39 measures. Two bundles of good grain, three bundles of moderate grain, and one bundle of poor grain take up 34 measures. One bundle of good grain, two bundles of moderate grain, and three bundles of poor grain take up 26 measures. How many of each type are there? So these days we would write down three simultaneous equations, uh, and that's what's done, done here except that here they've written them in a table from left to right and vertically. Okay. And we then manipulate these e equations uh, using what is now called Gaussian elimination. And that's exactly what the Chinese did here. They, the method of Gaussian elimination, which dates from about 1800, is exactly the same as the method that the Chinese used 2,000 years earlier. And so they go through the same sort of... Uh, I mean, it's all rotated through... Um, 90 degrees and so on, but it's essentially exactly the same method and, uh, and you end up with the answers two and three quarters, four and a quarter and nine and a quarter. So it's exactly the same as the one 
that Gauss gave later, but Gauss is the one that seems to get the credit now. Another preoccupation of the Chinese was the evaluation of pi, um, the ratio of the circumference of the circle to its diameter. Um, and we've already seen how the Egyptians ta uh, tackled it. The Mesopotamians also had a method which gave a slight underestimate for pi, um, about 3.125, I think theirs was. Um, Archimedes uh, got estimates for pi by comparing the perimeters of polygons drawn inside and outside the circle. So he started off with a circle, he drew a hexagon in, inside, a hexagon outside, calculated the per perimeters, and he got estimates, upper and lower estimates, which weren't very good. So he then doubled the number of sides to, to 12, 24, 48, and then 96, uh, uh, giving the lower estimate of 3 and 10 71st, and the upper estimate of 3 and a 7, 22 over 7, the one that we all know. Well, in his classic in the Island of the Sun, of around 260 AD, uh, Liu Hui carried on this, this process, continuing doubling the, the polygons. I mean, they obviously didn't draw these polygons, but they had a method of doing the calculations uh, whenever you double the number of sides. Uh, and he was concerned with areas rather than perimeters, but it's still the same idea. And he doubled up from 96 to 192. He eventually got to 3,072 to 3, and got the estimate, which in our decimal notation we would write as 3.14159. But even more impressive, around 500 AD, uh, uh, Zhu Zhongzhi um, and his son extended this to polygons with 24,576 sides. Uh, and thereby obtained pi to what we would now think of as six decimal places, 3.141592, and it's between six and seven. Uh, and they also uh, replaced the crude estimate 22 over seven by the, more, the better one, 355 over 113, which gives pi to six decimal places, and that approximation wasn't rediscovered in Europe until a thousand years <coughs> later. And further improvement didn't come until around uh, 1400 in the Islamic world. Well, I'd like now to look at Indian mathematics, concentrating in particular on three mathematicians, Aryabhata the Elder, Brahmagupta, and Bhaskara. Uh, Aryabhata looked at Diophantian equations. A Diophantian equation is one where we're interested in finding whole number solutions to equations. Um, and Aryabhata gave the first systematic treatment of these around 500 AD. He was also interested in trigonometry, which had come in about 500 years earlier with Hipparchus, and constructed tables of the sine function. Brahmagupta, possibly the greatest of the three, discussed the idea of zero as a number to calculate with, showed how to solve quadratic equations, essentially the Mesopotamian way, and looked at a particular type of equation that we now call Pell's equation. Bhaskara, much later, uh, wrote a famous arithmetic book called Lilavati, in which he showed how to simplify certain numbers using square roots. He had essentially formulae like this. So, in, in particular, he, he had a formula that can be used to show the square root of 17 plus the square root of 240 is equal to root 12 plus root 5. So let's look at these uh, Aryabhata. One of his main contributions was to sum various arithmetic series. For example, if we look at an arithmetic progression, such as 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus dot 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 plus 31, or, or this one here, um, then you can find the sum of all the numbers in it. According to Aryabhata, the desired number of terms, minus 1, halved, multiplied by the common difference between the terms, plus the first term is the middle term. This multiplied by the number of terms desired is the sum of the desired number of terms. Well, that's not exactly user-friendly from our point of view, but it was a, a description in, in words. Of course, the algebraic notation that we use today w wasn't available. But um, um, another version that he gave is uh, you take the sum of the first and last terms and you multiply it by half the number of terms. So this gives you the expressions that we use now. In the 7th century, Brahmagupta uh, gave rules for calculating with zero or cipher, um, and, and also positive or negative numbers. Um, 
we're not quite sure when zero first came in. It might have been 400 AD. The first uh, actual um, written record, I think, is not till about 800. But there is this description of how to use zero. So zero is not just a placeholder, it is a number to calculate with. And so in the 7th century, uh, Brahmagupta said, the sum of cipher and negative is, is negative. If you take zero and add a negative number, you get a negative number. Of positive and naught, positive of two ciphers, cipher. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure why he uses cipher and naught. Are they interchangeable? Uh, if, if we have an expert here, uh, it, that would be uh, good to know that. He also said that negative ta taken from cipher becomes positive and positive from cipher is negative. Cipher ta taken from cipher is naught. The product of cipher and positive or cipher for a negative is naught. Of two ciphers, it is cipher. And then he gets very confused. Cipher divided by cipher is naught. Positive or negative divided by cipher is a fraction um, with that as denominator. Cipher div divided by positive or negative is, well, he, and so on. It, it would be many centuries before mathematicians really understood the problems caused by dividing by zero. And both Brahmagupta and Bhaskara worked extensively on a particular equation now known as Pell's equation which is an incorrect assignation um, by Euler. So this equation has the form cx squared plus 1 equals y squared and we're required to find whole number solutions x and y for any given, for, for given values of c. So here's one example. Tell me, O oh mathematician, what is that square which multiplied by 8 becomes together with unity a square? So you're trying to find integer solutions of 8x squared plus 1 equals y squared. And they gave methods for taking a solution and getting new solutions. In fact, as many new solutions as you like. Because you can spot quite easily that if x is equal to 1, this is 9, so y is equal to 3. So what you do is you write 1, 3, 1, 3. And then you multiply. You go 1 down to this 3. 1, 3 is a 3. 1, 3 is, is 3. If you add these two, you get 6. And that's a new value, of, a new value that works for, for x. Uh, and that if you put 6 in here, you get y is equal to 17. And they, of course, they didn't use this algebraic notation, but this is essentially the method that they use. To get another solution, uh, you write 1, 3, which is what you had before. You have the new one, 6, 17. 1, 17, uh, 17. Um, 6, 3s are 18. 18 and 17 give you 30, 35. That's another x that works. And you can work out that y is equal to 99. And so you can generate as many of these as you wish. And they were able to do some really quite remarkable um, uh, calculations. Uh, the most difficult ones were um, C is 61 and 69. 61 has very, very large solutions. 67 has easier ones, but they, they were able to get answers like um, the smallest solution is 59, 67 and 48,842. Uh, and that's small compared with the ones for, for, for 61. But the margin was too small to write that one out. <coughs> Um, before uh, I finish, I'd just like to talk about one more topic, and this was early work on permutations and combinations, the, the area of maths that we now call combinatorics. In the 6th century BC medical uh, treatise, uh, Sushruta uh, was investigating a number of ways of systematically combining six tastes used in cooking. Uh, so you have sweet, acid, saline, pungent, bitter, and astringent. And he found that you can, you can choose two of them in 15 ways, uh, three of them in 20 ways, and so on. Around 300 BC, uh, uh, the Jainas similarly studied combinations of five senses, and also, for some reason, combinations of men, women, and eunuchs. Uh, this gave rise to the phrase having a, a eunuch solution, of course. <laughs> <laughs> And around 200 BC, Pingala investigated combinations of short and long sy syllables in a metrical poem. Da, di, di, da, di. And how, how many different ways are there of, of, of arranging, arranging these? Much more substantial was the work of 
bearer Hanihira around 550 AD, who desired to find the number of perfumes that could be made from four ingredients chosen out of 16. So he must have had some sort of method for, for calculating this. Um, he, he, these you can list. Uh, these are much more difficult. And he, and he gave the correct answer of 1820. And Bhaskara uh, gave general rules for what we now call N factorial, N choose K, and so on. Um, so although Indian mathematicians were skilled in dealing with permutations and combinations and uh, binomial expressions were, begin were beginning to, to be studied, they never constructed what we now call Pascal's triangle, which lists uh, these um, combination numbers. Um, we call them binomial coefficients. They arise in multiplying out binomial expressions uh, and also as combinations. And I thought I'd end up by just showing you a couple of Pascal's triangles. The earliest one we know is actually uh, an, uh, an Arabic one uh, by al Karaji around uh, 1080, I think 1007 is the year that this came. So this is the earliest known Pascal triangle as far as I know. And this one of our experts um, tells an earlier one. But I'd like to end up with a Chinese Pascal triangle. This is from uh, 1303. Their treatise, The Precious Mirror of the Four Elements. Um, uh, and uh, so I thought it was a nice picture to end on. So thank you very much.